Hi, I'm Nick, an MCAT teacher and content creator at Kaplan. In this video, Ari, one of our expert instructors, will take you through a few of the toughest discrete questions from the Chem Phys section of Kaplan's free MCAT practice test. This test was designed by Kaplan's question writers and validated by our psychometrics team to be as representative of the actual MCAT as possible so you know what you're getting into on test day. Follow along to see how Ari attacks these discrete questions using Kaplan's question strategy. The answer choices for question 26 seem to indicate numbered locations on the graph, and the question asks for the section where the magnitude of acceleration is decreasing. I want to be very careful here because I know kinematics graphs can be a little confusing, and this graph shows velocity versus time. In addition, the question asks for where on the graph the magnitude of acceleration is decreasing, not just for when acceleration is decreasing. For magnitude to decrease, that means the value is getting closer to zero, either from the negative or the positive side. On a velocity versus time graph, the slope of the line is the acceleration. This is similar to how on a distance versus time graph, the slope is velocity. With that in mind, zero acceleration would be no slope, a flat section of the graph and we want that acceleration to be approaching zero. So this question is asking me for a section that has a slope that becomes flatter from the beginning to the end of the section. This process of rephrasing the question and making a prediction makes the task of evaluating the answers much more clear to me, making it much less likely that I miss a question that I could have gotten right. The answer choices don't include every section, only two through five, so I'll evaluate those for a section where the line segment becomes more flat. And that's where I find section three. The section begins deeper and becomes more flat, meaning that the magnitude of acceleration is decreasing. B must be the correct answer, since the question isn't asking for a comparison, just a section where that magnitude is decreasing. Section two and four had fairly constant accelerations since their slopes did not change much from the beginning to the end. Section four itself experienced the least total change in acceleration since it is the flattest section of the graph, but that's not what the question asked for. The question wants a section with a decreasing magnitude of acceleration, not with the lowest magnitude. And section five is the opposite of the correct answer the slope of the line begins shallow, and then it becomes steeper, meaning that the magnitude of acceleration is increasing. The acceleration for section five is the most negative because it indicates the only decrease in velocity in this range from section two to five. However, the question wants a decreasing magnitude of acceleration, not the most negative acceleration. The answer choices for question 27 all mention amplifying sounds by different numbers of decibels. And before I even read the question, this indicates some commonly tested important content knowledge. The question itself is pretty wordy, but it boils down to what amplification would turn 0.6% of the energy into 60%. My knowledge of the logarithmic nature of the decibel scale immediately tells me to first consider what factor we are multiplying by to get from 0.6 to 60%, and that means multiplying by 100. This is the equation for decibels and has two important characteristics that allows me to jump straight to the answer now. First, the equation involves multiplying by 10 in order to give decibels. Without that 10, you would get bells, named after Alexander Graham Bell, which explains why the B is capitalized. But our SI unit is the decibel with the decimetric prefix. So by default, we include that multiplication by 10. Practically, what this means is that when I look at decibel comparisons like this one, I mentally shift the decimal left by one for the given decibels. While decibels are the standard, bells tells you the power of 10 for the comparison between the two values. This scale is based on comparing how much louder a sound is than a reference intensity. The most quiet sound a human can hear, 10 to the negative 12 watts per square meter. Since it's based on a ratio, 
Comparing the two values in the scale as a ratio cancels out the reference intensity and just tells us how many times more intense the greater one is than the lesser one. The other important characteristic of the decibel equation is that it's logarithmic. So the scale is telling you what power of 10 is for that ratio between the two values. In this case, if something is 100 times louder than something else, 100 is 10 to the second power. This is just like the pH scale, where a change of 2 on the pH scale means that the proton concentration has changed by 100 times. 100 times louder is 2 bells louder, or 20 decibels louder, once we multiply it by the 10 in the equation. That makes answer choice B correct. The answer choices for number 28 are short sentences, two of them about unknown amounts and two about an indicator's pKa versus the equivalence point. Most importantly though, this is a not question. It does make me hesitate for a second. Normally, if two answer choices are perfect opposites, like C and D, then one of them is probably right. However, this is a not question, so I wanna be careful of overusing that sort of trend. Based on just the last sentence of the question stem and these answer choices, this question is asking me whether an incorrect amount of something or an incorrect match between the indicator pKa and the equivalence point could manage to still give correct results. The question itself gives a ton of numeric details, but based on the answer choices, none of them are relevant. All that really matters is that KHP is being used to determine the concentration of an unknown concentration of sodium hydroxide. So this is a classic titration. A known concentration and volume of an acid is being combined with an unknown base, and an indicator is being used to determine the amount of base required to reach the equivalence point. This is where I rely on solid knowledge of titrations. First and foremost, I always think of titrations as the process of counting. If you look at the equation for equivalence point, the units are moles of protons per liter times liters, which means that it's just the point where the moles of protons donated by the acid equals to the moles of protons accepted by the base. The question wants to know what can be changed and still give good results, so I need to eliminate anything that is required to find the correct number of moles of proton. So I'm going to start with the pair regarding the indicator pKa since that opposite nature still makes me think that's a good starting point. One of the most essential parts of a titration is to use an indicator with the pKa that is close to the equivalence point. The indicator changes color as the pH reaches the pKa value and is the only visual indication of pH during the titration. One way or another, if the pKa is not near the pH of the equivalence point, the titration won't work so both C and D can be eliminated because neither of them will allow for good results. Between A and B, the question is really whether it's important to know the amount of water that the KHP is dissolved in or the amount of KHP being dissolved. Since they're the two remaining answer choices, it must be true that one of them isn't important to the titration. I always keep in mind that titrations are about counting protons donated from the acid and accepted by the base, and KHP is our acid. If we measured its amount wrong, we would have the wrong number of protons. So that means B must be eliminated and A is our correct answer. But it's worth really understanding why answer choice A doesn't really matter. In the equivalence point equation, liter cancels to just give moles of protons. Only the moles of KHP originally in the solution matter, not the volume or the concentration. As long as we know the number of moles, which can be calculated from the precise mass given in the question stem, we'll be able to identify the number of moles of base added at the equivalence point and thereby calculate the concentration of the unknown sodium hydroxide solution. The answer choices to question 44 are all carboxylic acids with different substituents on their alpha carbon. The question asks which has the most stable conjugate base and that immediately throws up a content flag for me. Stable conjugate bases are what make acids more acidic. 
So really, this is asking which is most acidic. Before I dive into these answer choices, I'll take a moment to consider why stable conjugate bases mean stronger acids. When an acid donates a proton, it becomes more negative. If it starts neutral, like these carboxylic acids, then it will become completely negative. Being charged is unstable because the charge will just pull that proton back on, reforming the acid. So stabilizing a conjugate base means spreading out the charge in some way so it's less likely to pull the proton back on. All of these carboxylic acids do that because they have resonance between the two oxygens of the carboxylate group, spreading the negative charge between the two of them. The other way to spread the negative charge is through induction, where a nearby atom or group pulls the negative charge towards it. And that's the difference between these answer choices. The different groups on each of the answer choice molecules are different amounts of electron donating or withdrawing. To stabilize a conjugate base, we need to pull that electron cloud away. So this question could be also viewed as asking which is the most electron withdrawing substituent. In answer choice B, the ether group OCH3 is electron donating. So it will not be the right answer when two of the other answer choices are halogen. And simple acetic acid in answer choice D only has hydrogens on the alpha carbon, so it has no electron donating or electron withdrawing groups. Between A and C, fluorine pulls on the electrons more than chlorine does. This makes it the most electron withdrawing halogen. Other groups could have been more electron withdrawing, but it's the most electron withdrawing lone atom and the most stabilizing among this group for the conjugate base making C the correct answer. The answer choices for question 46 are very long and sprinkled with terms related to circuits. The question itself is asking how to measure the resistance of the body. To answer this, I first want to consider Ohm's law, which I have always considered to be the equation that defines resistance. We normally see Ohm's law as V equals to I times R. However, rearranging that equation to solve for R tells you what resistance really is, with R equals to V over I. So in Ohm, the unit of resistance is a statement of a volt needing to be applied to cause an amp of current. Higher resistance values means a greater voltage to get an amp of current. Lower resistance means less voltage to get an amp of current. Since resistance is a ratio of voltage to current, the method used should involve a voltage or current that is known and the other being measured. Then resistance would be determined by finding the ratio between those two values. This immediately matches to answer choice A. A known voltage is being applied and the current is being measured. With those two values then determined, resistance can be found. The person's perception of current would not be a useful method of determining resistance, nor would it be an ethical idea to necessarily create a perceivable shock, so B would not work. For answer choice C, voltage across a resistor in parallel to another component does not tell you anything about that component. Meanwhile, D unnecessarily includes an additional resistor and only measures current without expressing that a known voltage is applied. Determining resistance requires both current and voltage, which is why answer choice A works so well. Fifty-seven has answer choices that are numeric, and they look like they have units in A. But in fact, upon looking at the question, A is not the unit of amps, but a given value we are making a comparison based on. So what the question wants to know is how the energy falls from n equals to 3 to n equals to 2 compared to the energy required to remove an atom's ground state electron entirely. For this question, there is no way that I'm being asked to determine the exact value through any form of calculation. That's something the MCAT does not require and would not ask. Knowing this gives me the confidence that these answer choices are not about finding the exact value but being able to predict what range the value would be in. First thing I'm going to keep in mind is that this type of potential energy is conservative. When comparing the amount required to move an electron away from the nucleus from one position to another, the same amount is released on the reverse journey. 
The second important piece of information that I have is the maximum energy change occurs between ground state and the infinite distance. And each smaller transition within is a fraction of that total energy change. The transition occurring here is between the second and third energy levels. That means that it starts closer than being completely removed and falls to an energy level above ground state. The specific values don't matter. And that means that there will be some energy released, but it will be less than the amount of energy involved going from the ground to infinite distance. The correct answer must be B since it's the only answer in that range.